Hello, Alex here, and in this video, I want to share my thoughts and experiences after using the Fujifilm GFX 100S for the last six months for most of my personal work and all of my paid professional work. This isn't a full review because I still have a tremendous amount to learn about this camera, but for now, let's get into it. For about three and a half years, pretty much all of my personal photography has been done on film, with digital being kept to the side for my paid professional work. Given the rising costs of film and the number of stocks that are being discontinued, after I sold all of my Canon EF gear at the end of last year and the start of this year, I decided that I was going to invest in a system that I could happily use for my paid professional work, as well as scanning film, and also just have something that I would actually enjoy using it and want to go out and shoot with, so I could shoot more, but shoot less film in, on the personal side of things. I'm not gonna talk in this video about the specific reasons and facets and specs that made me go for the GFX 100S over another camera. And there were a couple of options I was considering. Um, if people want to hear about that, I guess let me know in the comments down below. But suffice to say, for now, this is the camera that I settled on because it met all of my professional needs and of those that did meet my professional needs, it met the most of my personal wants in a camera. The GFX 100S is the fourth digital medium format camera from Fujifilm in the GFX lineup. It sports a 102 megapixel BSI backside illuminated CMOS sensor coming in at 44 by 33 millimeters in size. So the aspect ratio is four to three, slightly more square than the typical three to two you see with full frame or APS-C cameras. The sensor is about 70% larger than a full frame sensor with a pixel pitch matching both the Sony a7R4 and the Fujifilm X-T4. The sensor is supported by an image stabilization module that can be used for both photos and videos and is rated for up to six stops of compensation with the 80 millimeter f1.7. Aside from actual image stabilization, you can use that same module for pixel shift photography, combining up to 16 images to get you a 400 megapixel photograph with full color information at every pixel. The overall design of the body is very DSLR-like. It's about the same size as a Nikon D850 or a Panasonic GH5, so it's big as mirrorless cameras go, but it's not that big given the size of the sensor and just in objective terms, it's not that big. It definitely does lean more towards the DSLR styling, having a PSAM dial rather than a dedicated ISO dial and a dedicated shutter speed dial. And I have the front and rear uh, command dials set to ISO and shutter speed respectively. You can customize the top LCD to show those dials, but I use it in the more DSLR style fashion because I'm not actually too pushed. I thought after using the X-T3 for so long, so many years ago, I would love coming back to dedicated dials, but I don't really miss it in practice. The front of the body is completely dominated by the lens mount and the rear LCD is a two axis tilt type we've come to expect from Fujifilm, which I personally prefer for photography rather than the side flip screen that you'd see on a lot of hybrid video cameras that a lot of people don't like for photography, which is definitely this camera's forte. Photos can be captured with up to 16 bit color or at up to five frames per second in continuous burst mode with continuous autofocus and tracking. Images can be saved to one or both of the dual UHS-2 card slots at the same time, and videos can be recorded at up to 4K 30p, 800 megabits per second, and the camera employs line skipping to maintain a poor but manageable level of rolling shutter. So as I said, I do have good things and bad things to say about this camera and this camera system in general, and I'm gonna alternate rather than do my usual full set of pros and full set of cons, I'll just go one by one because some of these are quite subjective. The camera fits wonderfully in my hands. I make no secret of the fact that I have arthritis and my hands are probably the most affected part of my body, but I can hold this for hours working or just hiking without issue. It's extremely comfortable and the deep grip is very easy for me to maintain a secure grip versus a lot of smaller cameras, say like, the Sony Alpha Line or a Nikon Z7, where that smaller grip means I have to crane my hand in a way that's quite uncomfortable for me personally. 
The GF 32-64 uh, and 80mm lenses fit and balance extremely well and they're not overly front heavy. It's a nicely balanced system in general and that contributes to the overall ergonomics being quite nice. I already mentioned that the camera has a two axis tilting screen so shooting in portrait mode is quite nice. And the only thing that I've actually changed on this camera is I've assigned AF on to the AE lock button rather than AF on itself because when I'm holding the camera vertically I can reach that a little bit more easily with my thumb. That's very specific to me and if that's all I needed to change it's pretty good. As technology progresses over time and new cameras come out in the lineup, there is there are new features that come out and there's sometimes a bit of redundancy between the new features and the old features and that can lead to some things being a bit clunky and unclear. The example I want to talk about here is the distinction between the face detection mode and the face selection mode. All of the GFX cameras have face detection which when enabled will automatically focus on whichever face is closest to the middle of the frame. Face selection allows you to use the rear joystick or the touch screen to just twiggle back and forth and select whichever frame, whichever face you want to within the frame. What makes it annoying to me is that the manual doesn't make this distinction very clear and when you toggle uh, face selection on and off it also enables or disables face detection. So I think you could just combine these features into one feature where it defaults to the middle frame but allows you to switch between them. The only reason that the old face detection still exists is that it's just a legacy feature so you have parity across the range. Say if you were using a 50S and a 100S in the same shoot you could have just face detection work the same for both. I don't really think that's a good enough reason and there are a few small things like this where they could have just been tidied up a little bit with the 100 and the 100S. This wasn't one of the deciding factors in me getting the camera, but inheriting the Fujifilm X Systems film simulations is a really nice to have, in my opinion. You have Pronex Standard, which just works for all of my professional paid work. Pronex Standard, white balance, exposure, contrast, done. For my personal stuff, Provia with minus 10 of the purples towards blue in the HSL panel, um, or just Acros, red or green. That's pretty much everything. I have enjoyed playing around with some of the newer film, film simulations, mainly uh, Nostalgic Neg, which reminds me a lot of Kodak Aerocolor, Filmwashi X, uh, Electra, Luminaire 100, Santa Film, it's that film, or the Classic Neg simulation to a much lesser extent. The fact that the Acros simulation in particular looks so much like Acros, Kyle McDougall spoke about that um, recently enough, and yeah, they're pretty much exactly the same. They're implemented really well and you kind of, I can rely on the colors to be better out of the box than I could with some of the cameras I've used in the past. And say for certain events where I'm working at an ongoing event, say over a period of hours, and they need pictures for social media as the event is still ongoing, I can trust, again in Pronex standard, that the colors are going to be pretty good right out of the box and I can just give someone an SD card and they can just start posting photos and that is a very small niche thing but it's just an example of how well the film simulations are implemented and how useful they can be. This may be the fastest digital medium format camera ever, you know, in terms of shooting speed, autofocus performance, uh, general operation, but it's still not a fast camera. You know, uh, and it very much depends on the lens that you use. If you don't have a linear motor in your lens, like with the 80 millimeter, Entering and exiting playback mode and booting up and shutting down the camera actually take longer than the lenses where you have a linear motor. Some of the lenses do that kind of shimmy like the old um, X-mount 35mm f1.4 which slows everything down. And like changing between certain modes, the camera can hang for a little bit, not so much lag, but just be a bit hesitant to actually do what you're trying to get it to do. Most of this can be mitigated with custom settings banks, which is what I've done. I have two for work, one for continuous autofocus with IAF, another one for single shot, but it's, it's relative, right? It's the fastest medium format digital camera, still just not that fast. 
Autofocus performance for static subjects is absolutely fantastic. F1.7, I autofocus, static subject, you've got flawless, nearly 100% hit rate. It's not the fastest autofocus in the world, but I'm willing to make that trade off for the accuracy. I'd rather get a few shots that are in focus than 30, half of which are out of focus. It is a bit more hit and miss when you're shooting a moving subject. Barely any worse when you're using eye autofocus to shoot people, like in event photography situations, but quite a bit worse when you're using the general tracking mode. I find that, I reckon that it's basically down to the tracking box being quite large and you can't change the size any smaller than the default. So it can give you photos that are in focus, just not where you want it to focus, like say on the beak of a bird or the wrong part of a car, that kind of thing. That said, I haven't used continuous tracking autofocus much without eye autofocus. Um, so I don't have that much experience with it and haven't tried it with the boost mode at all. So there's a good chance that that will make things quite a bit better. I'll have to see. But for now, I could safely say that the stills autofocus for static subjects is absolutely perfect. It's absolutely wonderful. Frankly, there is no justification for not having a D-pad and a second function button around the lens mount when those things are pretty much the norm for almost every competing camera. Even the Nikon Z30 that I'm recording on right now has two function buttons around the lens mount and that is a significantly cheaper little video camera that weighs about as much as two batteries that go into the 100S. Yes, I'm very annoyed about that and I thought it was something that was cut from this camera to differentiate it from the 100. Imagine paying five figures for the GFX 100 and not having a D-pad. This thing is expensive enough. You have touchscreen swipes. Yeah, wonderful. A lot of gloves, that doesn't work. In the cold, your hands might get cold and that might not work too well. D-pads and buttons are physically more tactile and responsive. Yeah, it's not the end of the world using touchscreen swipe gestures, but I shouldn't have to. As you would expect and hope from such an expensive system, the image quality can be absolutely stunning. Let's take a look at this picture of Remy. This was shot at, with the GF 80mm f1.7 wide open at f1.7 at like one centimeter back from minimum focusing distance. If we zoom in all the way, you can see there is a huge amount of detail in her eyebrow and in her iris. If we zoom in even more to like 400%, you can see me squatting on the floor, my mother behind me, the open dishwasher, the kettle on the counter, and the magnets on the fridge in the reflection in Remy's pupil at near minimum focusing distance where the lens performs worst at its widest, softest aperture. What? Obviously not every aperture setting is going to resolve the full 102 megapixels, but in real world shooting, that doesn't matter. From wide apertures to narrow apertures down to about f16 to 18, you can get wonderful, incredibly high resolution, high quality images. Even if you stop down to f22 or below, they can go a bit, images can go a bit glowy, especially with the 3264 because of the effects of diffraction, but you don't really notice it in real world shooting, only in a side by side, so it's not actually a problem. Uh, related to this, the high ISO noise performance seems to be very, very good because although there is a lot of noise from the small pixels viewed at like a normal image size, the pixels of noise are so small that it doesn't really matter. I haven't done any formal testing, nor will I, but subjectively I would rate it as very, very good. I've shot this at up to ISO 6400 at events with not really any problems. When I said earlier that the autofocus performance was fantastic, at least for you know static subjects, I meant for photos. Even though I said it was a bit questionable for certain situations for photos, it was fine. It's more than good enough for my needs anyway. I tried it for video, and in my experience, it is absolutely trash. The image quality itself, the log profile, shooting in a Turner without log, absolutely incredible, but it doesn't matter if your videos aren't in focus, and I'm a little bit too animate to use manual focusing. I know a lot of people have had excellent results with these cameras, with these lenses, with autofocus. I don't know if it's because of the glasses or my specific lighting setup. All I can say is it's absolutely unusable for my purposes for talking head YouTube videos, and even just recording B-roll I tried doesn't work that well. 
uh, the proof. Basically, if you want to check, is my recent video on my first roll of Rollout Blackbird, which was recorded with the GFX 100S. Um, I didn't even finish color grading that video because why would I bother getting it 100% perfect if most of the video is out of focus? Go and have a look at it. The performance there was completely unacceptable. I tried all the various tips that people gave me online. Nothing worked. The in-body image stabilization system is absolutely fantastic. I've been able to shoot with both the 32 to 64 and the 80 millimeter lenses down to like 1 30th to even 1 6th of a second with no motion blur from me whatsoever. And you need that with such a high resolution sensor. The only bad thing I can say about the IBIS is that it's very power hungry. So I've mapped it to one of my custom function buttons so I can turn it off very quickly when I don't need it. But I would rather have a very power hungry IBIS system than one that doesn't work that well. And it's not the end of the world to carry a second battery, especially when you have USB power delivery. Although I do like the film simulations, I do use the in-camera corrections to get them a bit closer to what I like straight out of camera. Plus two color, plus one and plus a half on the tone curve, plus one sharpness, that kind of thing, just to get the straight out of camera JPEG as close to perfect as possible for when I do need it. One of the settings that I like the look of, and it's very subtle, it's not the end of the world, I can live without it, is clarity. If you set the clarity setting to anything other than zero, positive or negative, and you shoot raw plus JPEG, or you're using the in-camera raw converter, the camera basically locks up while it struggles to render that JPEG with the clarity setting applied. I have no idea why this is such a problem with this and other Fujifilm cameras, whatever way they've implemented clarity, but the camera becomes pretty much unusable. And if you're using the raw converter, it's not the end of the world because you shouldn't be using that in the middle of a shoot while you're actively shooting. But if you're shooting raw plus JPEG and you forget that you have clarity applied, you have to wait for that file to be rendered and then saved before you can so much as open playback or change something on the dials. You can't do anything. It stands out as something that's just really poor on an otherwise excellent camera. So yeah, the Fujifilm GFX 100S is not a perfect camera by any means, and I'm not going to lie to you and try and tell you that it is. No camera is perfect. You just have to find the camera that suits your use case the best with the fewest compromises. Six months ago, I felt like for me, for personal work, paid work and film scanning, this was the right choice. Today, I still feel like it was, and that's good enough for me. This camera, again, is not perfect, but I'm just loving using it, right? The most important thing is that it sparks joy and you want to go out and take pictures and make work that you're happy with. It doesn't make a difference if it's digital, if it's film, if it's expensive, if it's cheap, if it's wide angle, if it's telephoto, DSLR or mirrorless. If you're having fun and taking photos, that is what matters, right? This camera, all, despite its many, many flaws, is working very, very nicely for me. And I'm looking forward to sharing more content and testing out different things I have in the pipeline and sharing those with you in the near future. I'll finish out this video with a gallery of a few more images I've taken over the last few months. But otherwise, stay safe and bye bye for now. If you don't already, follow me on Instagram at Shaka1277 for new pictures every day. If you like this video and enjoy what I do on the channel, please consider subscribing or checking out my Patreon where the tiers start at just one euro per month.